Well, good morning, everyone. Good evening if you're in the Americas. If you're in Australia, enjoy your coffee. Uh, it'll be fully caffeinated by now. If you're in the States, maybe you'll be uh, moving on to decaf. Welcome, g'day, and our special guest today, and I say our special guest is my special guest, is my best new friend ever, Brian mm -hmm. from Bezel T3. Brian, say g'day, mate. Hey, how y'all y'all doing? I'm glad to be here with Phil and no apologies. Yeah, it is good. And the other apologies, no apologies guys, actually give their apologies today because there have been uh, some family situations and we all work and have real lives. And so uh, they've dispersed to various parts of the country to do the things that they need to do. Uh, but today we're just kicking off with many of you really know Brian's work and I've been following Brian's work for ages. What I like to call leaping tall heresies in a single bound with Brian Bezel T3. And I think, um, Brian, that's a little bit to do maybe with your um, work with aeroplanes as well. It's not that hard once you know how something works to get over it pretty easily, I would imagine. Yeah, that's true. That's true. You know, airplanes have a have a habit of uh, getting from point A to B, and it's going to take some altitude. So uh, once once you've broken ground, you're uh, you're going flying, and the smart pilots that. keep flying even if they got a problem. <laughs> I, I love it. Well, look, let's let's just flick this up a little bit. You know, I sent you those questions. I didn't send you this one. I said there were no gotcha questions. This is really not a gotcha question, but it's yeah. not on the approved yeah. list, and it's one of those ones that just gets inside someone's. Um, someone's psyche and someone's life just a, a little bit more that says, look, if you really knew me, you would know that dot, dot, dot. Yeah. Fill in the blanks for us, Brian. Yeah. Well, if you really knew me, you probably wouldn't want to hang out with me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, that's probably a better question to ask my wife, you know, or oh, my children. Okay. Because they tell you the truth. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, I mean, I'm just, I'm just a regular guy. I'm a sinner saved by grace, and um, I do, I do enjoy time. I'm, um, you know, I'm a guy that, that tries to be helpful and and uh, try to love my neighbor. But uh, boy, you know, nothing, nothing special about me at all, really. Mm. It's good to be sometimes unspecial. I, I, I spent a lot of years. Let's talk about me. I spent a lot of years in. Um, charismatic and Pentecostal type movements where everyone was trying to make me have something special or some bigger dream and uh, and what what find out what my unique super purpose in the in, in the world that God had for me was uh, and I spent a lot of years being frustrated about not being ordinary and you know what I really like it <laughs> I really like being ordinary yeah. so yeah. from one ordinary bloke to another and you know what? Great, I found out that being here. being ordinary doesn't mean being mediocre. No, uh, it does not. Because no. God uses regular people. He uses just average Joes. A lot of people in the Bible that, that God used for special purposes, there was actually nothing very special about them. Um, That's true. But, but God can use, uh, he uses means, and so he can use whoever he wants to, whenever he wants to. And I am... Um, I take great solace in that, yeah, because I'm not a world changer. I'm, I'm not. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm not one of those guys that, that's going to be, uh, you know, changing changing society or uh, making my mark that people will remember for yeah. you know decades to come. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I really empathize with that because that that's sort of me to a T. I've gone through those points of thinking, oh, you know, you need to make a mark. It's been told you need to make a mark. All these things are brought up around you in how the world operates and, and when the church does not quarantine the influence of the world, when it's in the world and of the world at times, um, then we get, the sheep get sucked into that kind of poisonous sheep dip as well. And we wonder why we're not happy being sheep. That's right. That's right. We're always, we're always you know, we, we tend to search for that, that element that's going to give us some type of, um, I don't know, kind of lift uh, or, or mm -hmm. special, special meaning that uh, be good. we've hit, be good. Yeah, yeah, we've hit that, we've hit that mark. And um, that's, that's really not, it's not realistic. You can't live, that's not sustainable. You can't live that way. No, no, you can't. Oh, and look, one thing that also will happen from time to time, we'll get little comments that come through from the YouTube folks there. So if you see those pop up, okay, that's all that is. Hey, right. Matt, thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic. I've got to 
Remind me when I do these next time, Brian, to turn off all my notifications, will you? That'd be really good. <laughs> so, I've got so much going on the, on the dashboard here. Well, from one ordinary oh, boy right. to another, it's great to be here. Look, let's. Like, I want to I kick in, and these things will sort of be a bit of a two-way reflection, folks. We, we, it is just a very informal brother-to-brother -brother chat, but it's got a little bit of structure underneath as well, just so we don't just wander all over the place. So, and I'd really like to find out these questions myself. So, Brian, how do you define what... Bezel T3 is about, you know, your purpose for it. Now, I'm, I'm talking really about um, your YouTube video presence yep. um, and and a, a bit of your backstory about how you got started. I'm very interested in how people begin what you would call a ministry or a specific mm -hmm. work outside of their employment. Yeah, yeah. And, and then once you've done that, you can look at the white text below. <laughs> I don't think we might have even started tickling that, but, but go ahead. The, the floor is yours, my friend. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, when I was, when I was uh, pushing 50, when I was 49 years old, I started thinking about, you know, gee whiz, my, my life is, is going by. And back in the day, you know, when I was uh, pushing six, 50, it was like uh, MySpace. I don't know if anybody remembers yes. MySpace and whether it's still on the internet or not, but they did have a, a video option. And I thought, you know what, I'll chronicle my kind of my last year in my 40s and just, you know, share whatever's on my mind. And of course, yeah. I want to bring in my, my Christian roots and, and my Christian convictions. And so I started doing that on MySpace. And I came across um, a sermon one day by Joel Osteen. And I, that was one of the first times I'd ever heard him. And I saw the, uh, you know, this is my Bible, you know. Mm -hmm. it, 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 it is, it, I am who it says I am, and he has this mantra, right? So the first thing I did was I, I just kind of did a little uh, back and forth on each little stanza of his mantra and uh, yeah. <clears throat> put it up there and, you know, got a few people to look at it and so forth. Well, my brother looked at it and he said, you know, Brian, that's what you really should focus on. That that you have a you have a knack for for looking at stuff like that, and so that's when I started to look into YouTube and started mm -hmm. a channel. I actually started a channel uh, that was Bezel T3. Now, for those of you who don't know, and I get this question a lot, Bezel is my nickname at work, and T3 is it stands for Triple Three. That's what I started on Bezel Triple Three. And the, that's just my simple way of, of uh, describing, uh, you know, the, the Trinity. It's one number, uh, one divine being, and yet it's three distinct numbers, uh, which uh, d describes the, uh, the threeness of, of the Godhead. So that's, that's the Bezel T3 secret right there. But um, I started, and then like two years later, I think, I got shut down because somebody claimed copyright infringement. And back, back then, YouTube was oh. much more stringent on uh, copyright um, and see now everybody's discovered. Hey, if people use my stuff, I can monetize off them. Mm -hmm. So I get a little bit more, you know, kind of uh, free to to use a particular piece of music or a clip yes. or something. And now you get three strikes. It's the three strikes law on YouTube, right? Um, That's right. They'll give you, you know, if you got a copyright strike, they're going to say you got one. If you get three, we're going to shut down your channel. Mm. So if I get one, I'm very careful. And in fact. You guys do the hit the bar like Stephen Kozar. Yeah, that's right. I started doing that as a result of being shut down, or not shut down, but um, but mm -hmm. being, being given a copyright strike. This last time it was from Perry Stone's organization. I saw that. that. Did it. Yeah. So I thought, you know, maybe I need to make what I'm showing kind of one step removed, and the, mm -hmm. the hit the hit the bar motif uh, or format works really well. So, yeah. anyways, um, I've been doing this for about 13 years, and um, just been plugging along and you know probably about a year and a half ago two years ago i decided you know i, I really want to get more um kind of consistent so i started cool. doing uh, a video every week every saturday i try to publish and and yeah. then i thought well I'll, st I'll start doing one and throw it up and I, I really realized that people do like that if people are interested in what you're doing um they want yes. content and so that's what i've been doing and um you know in my welcome video that's on my my home page of the channel, I pretty much tell the story. You know, I just, I look at the more you know, kind of avant-garde uh, areas of evangelicalism and I tend to, you know, I tend to go for the stuff that's the more low-hanging fruit because I'm not sure. a scholar and I, I couldn't, um, I couldn't, you know, dissect somebody who's mostly, you know, right on and might have a few little problems that we could talk about doctrinally. 
but I, I have a lot of fun with the you know with the people that are just blatantly blatantly in error yeah and, and there uh, are there are some doozies out there I have to say Brian some of the things as myself and the lads have gotten into this work ourselves with no apologies um, our, our work started in I was born a poor black child and I just quite a Steve Martin <laughs> Um, well, we just got banned off YouTube straight away. Um, <laughs> we, we started in a country church. So we're in a country area. Coffs Harbour is halfway between Brisbane and Sydney on the east coast of New South Wales. And most people have a bit of an idea because of Finding Nemo where Sydney might be. P. <laughs> Sherman, 32 Wallaby Way, Sydney. And so they, they know that there's lots of little fish that swim around there. Well, we're north of where those little clownfish actually swim. Oh, really? And we were a small, we, we, were all, we were at that stage all part of a, a small church, um, Australian Christian Churches Church. And that was at that stage the same overarching group that Hillsong was a part of. Ah. We're not all there anymore. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it was a lovely right. place and lots of really uh, fantastic people there, it's lots of fantastic Christians. We've moved on for. Our, our own reasons, uh, my wife and I, and Steve and his wife as well. Uh, but we started there with the support of our senior pastors, um, who are absolutely fabulous people, uh, to start an apologetics workshop group once a month. And that, you know, we, we just, as a bunch of maturing Christian men, thought there's a gap here. There's a bit of a need for us to help Christians. Um, in, in their defense of the gospel themselves, just to equip the saints. And we thought, well, let's do this. The pastors were right behind that. And then so we started these um, monthly workshops. We tackled all sorts of um, very diverse topics as well. So some of them were straight up and down. Um, you know, did Jesus really die? You know, you bring in Gary Habermas's stuff and things like that. Mm -hmm. But we also tackled what is a Christian response to crazy topic X as well, because people play around on yeah. the fringes of those. Now, we're, yeah. Not, yeah. we're not fringe dwellers, but we find that interesting that Christians need to be able to have a response for that. So we, we tackled secret societies, we tackled UFOs, what's the Christian response to, and how, how does that go from there? Now, we, we did that until COVID, and then it was, no, we were pushed hella high water online to do mm -hmm. something, because, you know, even in Australia, the land of the free, the home of the brave. No, wait, uh, Scotland. Um, but where we are, it was still locked down. How many COVID cases in Coffs Harbour? Zero. Really? Um, that's right. It's a nice place to be. You should come and visit. Grab your plane. Wow. Grab your wife. Get over here. Um, but we then went online, and that's been a discovery for us. We were like, how do we put these seminars online? And then you start discovering people. You start looking at the world right. of people that are interacting with Biblical theology. We came across um, your work, Roseborough's work, uh, Steve Kozar's work. That that sort of thing. And you go, I'm actually getting a clear line of biblical and theological sight that's starting yeah. to happen because people are bringing to light bad teachings and saying mm -hmm. you're allowed to say that's not Christian, and you're bringing up sloppy sermons and you're allowed to say, hey, that's not 100% accurate. They're actually missing the essence of the gospel in there. And that was very freeing for us and for our families to be able to go, yes, this is something that's very important. And we thought, look, if this is happening for us, if that, you know, gadunk moment is happening for us, I wonder yeah. how many ordinary folks out there are believers, are saved, but are just maybe badly tended or poorly tended or um, badly fed sheep. Yeah. You're like, what, what can we do? We're not pastors. We're not in the church. But we're just like, maybe if we can get people some skills, some, some listening skills, some discernment skills to hear what's being said to them in an ordinary sermon, that might be really helpful for them. And so that's where our, our sort of networks have crossed over with yes. your work, Brian. And it's, yeah. it's, it's a, so that when it comes to our purpose, that's one of those things. We, we certainly, when it comes to this second part of the question here, how special are you to be able to criticize other Christians? I'm sure you might say like us, oh, we're not. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think that everyone um, needs to be able to be critiqued when they are speaking on behalf of God. 
Um, yeah. if, if you're willing, if you're willing to be a pastor, and especially if you're willing to put your stuff online, um, then you you leave yourself open for you know being looked at and people being able to say, well, is what you're saying in agreement with what the Word of God is saying? And if it isn't, um, I I believe I have the right, uh, just as my opinion, to be able to point that out. And so. That's, you know, people, people have uh, emailed me and, and made comments and stuff. Why don't you just, you know, why do you stop judging people? Why, why don't you stop um, pointing out their flaws, you know, showing, yeah. trying to show the, you know, the, the, uh, the speck in their own eye or, or mm-hmm. you know, take out the plank, you know, type thing. And, and, and I'm saying, well, I can't go to them. It's not, it's not as easy as you might think to try to find someone and actually, you know, get them to sit yeah. down and listen to you. Um, That's right. and, like I, and like I say, they're putting their stuff out in public. And so people like you and people like me have every right to critique um, or agree with, you know. Uh, I'm, Correct. I, I, so that's that's all I'm doing. And I'm just trying to I'm trying to square what certain people are saying in the name of God with what the Bible says. And so yeah, I, and, absolutely. And, and there's absolutely a, there's absolutely a um, an appetite for getting the other side because yeah. these people that that go to, you know, particular churches that that uh, pa- whose pastors I've I've reviewed are uh, just lock lockstep with this particular individual yeah. and don't always hear. And that's really the people I'm after. Yeah. I'm after yeah. the people that are going to that particular church, listening to this particular person, and maybe just in God's providence, they're going to stumble upon this video and get the other point of view. And uh, if God chooses to use what, you know, what people like you and I are doing, then all the better uh, that they, they would come out of the sometimes just blank, just rank deception that they're being taught. Yeah. And, and sometimes, it, sometimes it is, it, it is that, that I, I have found you know, there is a scriptural, um, I'll call it an injunction, you know, a scriptural backing to be able to um, critique what has been said in the name of God publicly. The Bereans were hailed for doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, lifestyle wise, Peter was criticized by Paul for doing that. The book yeah. of Jude is pretty much all about that. So I think. I think the Bible's a pretty public document. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I think if it says if it says you can give it a go, you can give it a go. <laughs> There's something very different, though, to if your brother offends you, and you know, or mm-hmm. go to them personally. That's about a personal sin. That's right. about you not gossiping and right. judging badly. Those right. those are not they're not opposed. They're two separate categories, and and so those are things where we have stepped in and gone. We our motivation for this is to free and feed and help the sheep. It's yeah. it's a, a love um, for the truth and it's a love for the children of God to be able to say, hey, you know what you're eating over there in the paddock, sheep? That's actually weeds. Do yeah. you know how to tell the difference between good grass and weeds? That's all we're doing and we certainly try to avoid. I can be quite acerbic in my sense of humor. So I need to be really controlled. I, I, I think I have tongue studs now from biting my tongue so much. <laughs> My wife always says when I do any hit the bars, she says, she does, take this the right way, folks. She doesn't say channel like I'm about to channel a spirit. But she says, <laughs> channel your inner Mike Winger. Ch- you know, <laughs> be, the, be the gentleman of the, uh, yes. of the internet. Yes. Um, and so we, we are not wanting to attack the pastor or the person, even if sometimes, as you pointed out, low-hanging fruit is ridiculous. Yeah. You know, but other things like that uh no we're not attacking the person it's the mm-hmm. preaching it's that's it's right. not the man it's the message that's right and that's hard to do sometimes you know it's it is. Um, it, it, there's a tendency always to look either at the style of the of the preacher or the just the hijinks uh that he is he's up to during his his preaching but you yes, got to stay on point that. you got to stay on the content and and not make it personal um i i sometimes get sad when i read comments and they they get personal about the person, either their yes. their, their appearance or uh, their style of clothes. Um, believe me, there's there's lots you could comment on, but as there Christians, is. as Christians, we need to say, hey, this person is deceived, and deceived people deceive people, and this is oh, what we're after. Good. We're after the truth. We're after, you know, shining a light, shining a light of the gospel of Jesus Christ everywhere we can. And so if there's, if there's darkness in anything that somebody's 
preaching, and, and there may be, let's say, 90% truth of what someone's saying, but then it, it turns away from, from Christ and him crucified, uh, it's, no longer, it's no longer the truth. It's diluted truth, which is what Satan absolutely loves. He absolutely yeah. loves that. And there really is, and there's something so central about that. I, I remember sitting... In a you know in a in a in a church service we do it frequently in fact and um, my daughter was on another side of the church auditorium and she was sixteen or seventeen at the time it was an Easter message yeah and every now and again she would send me a text message now I don't recommend doing this but it was just you know what my daughter and I were doing at that time uh, it's a number of years ago now some people might have seen a, a one video I did with with uh, my daughter Deborah. I'll try and get her back on to do some more. You know what dads are like with their daughters. We brag terribly. <laughs> That's right. And it was an Easter We're allowed. <laughs> We're allowed. We've put a lot into this to brag. That's right. Um, and, and finally, at the end of the sermon, and it's the Easter Sunday sermon, she sends this text, this, and I loved it. She said, well, that was almost the gospel. And I went, yeah. I love the fact that I could, not that I heard that, but that I got that from my, you know, exactly. teenage daughter who could say, yeah, they, they were almost there. And I go, mm. That's what we want people to be able to to pick up is what's yeah. really, um, you know, what's really going on, and how do we then help people hear um, what that is? Now, on that, here, here's the next question I want to to flick to. Let me get my control panel working here, mm -hmm. just to guide us. And it's on this theme of deception. Yeah. But it looks like that, and this is to me some of the juice for deception in the church with rapid ongoing social change accelerating what do you see as the you know the risks to the biblical church and i don't just mean the church that's a very broad yeah very very broad term right yeah i'm yeah. really thinking the biblical christian church how do you how do you see that how does that play in your thinking yeah well no church is immune uh no no you know, Bible-based, Christ-centered church is immune from error, and we always have to be on guard. Um, you know, churches that have a good form of government, um, in, in wherein the the pastor is accountable to a group of elders, and mm -hmm. um, and the elders are actually there to protect the sheep from the pastor if he starts going astray. And so there there always needs to be a good form of government. The the problem yeah, with sure. evangelical churches today especially the big ones, mm. is the mm. pastor becomes really, in effect, the pope of that particular church. He runs yeah. the show. Yeah. He calls the okay. shots. Everybody gets in lockstep with him, or you're out the door. You know, you, yeah, so you're it's no like longer a, part of the leadership. It's like a bit of a pyramid structure it down. It's exactly yeah. that. Yeah. And, you know, even, even good, solid churches um, always have that tendency where the senior pastor, the person in charge... Uh, even very subtly, you know, can kind of run the show. And so it's so yeah, important to get elders who are, you know, just uh, very godly men that really fit the, um, you know, the, the criteria that's that's given in, in 1 Timothy and, and Titus. Um, it's very important. That's a really good point. That is a really good point because that to some degree, no matter what the external um, challenge might be, like if I just flick back to the question, if I say, if you're looking at what the risks are, one of the first first risks to the biblical church is not being well structured not being biblically structured to stand against whatever is out there is that kind of the the theme you are taking there mate yeah yeah exactly i mean we've got we've got lots of stuff always coming at the church um nothing is new under the sun right we're, we're told that in ecclesiastes yeah, and, and it's been the same you know it's been the same kind of uh schemes that the devil uses to uh to infect a, a, a body of believers he, he doesn't have any really new ideas he just tweaks them a little bit yeah and so yeah. you know whether it's whether it's um you know deception in teaching or the kind of the narcissistic tendencies of the the people in charge um we, we've got to be we've we've always got to gauge what's happening in in the church with what um, yeah okay. with what the word of god says and and yes. like you say you know the, the the social change that's happening right now is infecting the the church um 
the wokeism, you know, all this, all this, yes. everybody's a racist, everybody's, you know, uh, equity instead of equality, all that stuff. It's starting to come into the church. It's, it's becoming its own problem that needs to be dealt with. Uh, some churches more than others, but it is becoming. That's a good point. That is a good point. And I think if you look at the central part of um, Christian, a Christian living experience, which is you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You don't need to necessarily be an expert in all the challenges that are coming your way because persecution will come. That's yes, a yeah. given. A, Jesus, what does he say? What, yeah, what, a, what a marketer. What a marketer our Lord was. Come and die. Come and get persecution. Yeah. Come yeah. and be yeah. hated by your mothers and fathers and daughters and wives and things. But knowing the truth. So obviously, folks, I'm not trying to be trite there. I'm just pointing out that Many people sell the, the Christian life to be um, a panacea for, uh, for life's troubles when really it's a panacea for sin and eternity. Um, but that's a really good point, Brian, because when you know the truth and you know how Christians should live and work and operate to, together and what the truth should be and how we should hold on to the truth, that then becomes our self reinforcing spiritual framework to stand against any attack because that lion is out there prowling around looking for someone yeah. to devour and so when you have an elevated pastor when really jesus says if you want to be a leader you've got to be a, a servant yeah like me so that elevation is a is a tricky one i actually want to play a little bit of um a little bit of a fun game with us and with the audience at the moment. So folks out there on chat land, um, I'm going to try and see how this works. If I can get my two computers that I need to uh, work with here, go away, you. Good, good, good. Uh huh. My wife's computer needs a little bit of TLC. <laughs> um, it's going to be dun 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 dun. Okay. Here's a little quiz is going to come up, folks, so feel free. I won't be able to put all these on screen. The biggest risks to the biblical Christian church, and we want to ask uh, of the list that I share below. Oh, look at this. Come on. Come on, uh -oh. Microsoft. Uh -oh. no, we've got this. We've got this. Is it? This happens every now and again. Is it unfriendly Christians? Is the biggest risk to the biblical Christian church the Chinese Communist Party? Is it poor theology, word of faith, NAR? Is it cold coffee and stale biscuits? I've been there. <laughs> Ten years of itinerant ministry as a young man told me that there are plenty of churches with bad coffee and, and poor biscuits. Even in Australia, yes. there was bad coffee. Yes. Um, critical theory, social justice, wokeness, is that the biggest risk to the biblical Christian church? Insufficient car parking. Heavens knows if you can't get the crowds into your church. Pragmatism, if folks know what, uh, what pragmatism is, it's that theory of anything goes to some degree. Oh, and the screen is, oh, there it is. catching up. Insufficient car parking. Come on, pragmatism. I'm, I see the screen is behind me, so that's something about our streaming. Yeah. Um, what do you think, folks? What do you think, Brian, out of, out of, out of those? Gee, if I had to pick one as, as probably the worst... Uh thing that can happen it's got to be the the cold coffee and the biscuits you know? I mean, it, it is it is the one approved drug you know that we will be addicted to and it's okay oh i'm kidding um no no if they really loved me they put the effort in <laughs> you know i gotta go back to um you know poor theology because really Theology is the study of God. It's it's yeah. it's it's what we're all about as humans to to know God and and more importantly than that, as I was reminded by my pastor the other night, to be known oh. by God. Yes. And and if you're known by oh, God, yes. as we as we read in Galatians, uh, you want to know Him better and you want to love Him mm -hmm. more and then love neighbor more. And so, if you get the right theology, right practice is going to you know uh, orthopraxy is going to follow good orthodoxy and so yeah. it's super important for us to put that for uh, uh, first but uh, not to say that uh, unfriendly churches are uh you know we'll just throw, we'll just toss that aside there's nothing worse than than entering into a church uh where you're a visitor 
and yes. people people don't even recognize your existence. So not to downplay the other things you've listed there, but without good theology, without a Christ-centered, cross-focused uh, emphasis in everything the church does, um, we're basically just a um, you know uh, a civic club. Yeah, and if we're a civic club, we're not a very good one. Yeah, you know, yeah. when you do all of those things, there there are some churches that do master um, the the social side of things for um, a lack of, you know, good theology as well. Like we've seen that with the seeker sensitive folks who are really, really good at nailing mm -hmm. the stuff um, oh, yeah. and, and missing the the guts of things. And, yes. and, and so look, uh, I, I did, thanks. Uh, there's a lot of chat that people put in the chat pod that was very funny on the side. They were able to catch up with that uh, a bit later on. But I think it's, it's what I liked Brian, is you're able to pick up that there's there's quite an interaction of different things that go on. There's definitely the poor theology. So when we raised that question with Justin Peters a, a month or so ago, that was the similar point. Like it's like, what is at the heart of mm -hmm. that? And that's theology. And then the practice of that theology yeah. will take care of all those yeah. other bits and pieces. And yeah. so my, my my wife and I have spent a lot of time in church ministry work. Uh, we've, we're coming up 30 years. This is our 30th anniversary wow. this month. So congratulations. Yeah, you know, thanks, yeah. my friend. I know you're just <laughs> looking there going, like, I've been there, done that. But uh, <laughs> it's nice to be on this side of it. And um, and in that time, we've always been doing something together in in some kind of Christian ministry. We met and traveled for 10 years as young kids without kids uh, yeah. in itinerant ministry. And then uh, when kids came along, we joined uh, a local church in Western Sydney, uh, and we were on staff there for a while doing a number of different things. And uh, again, moving north again to where we are now, we've always mm. been a, a part of churches. And that first 10 years of traveling itinerant ministry lets you see a lot of the strengths that are there in the church, a lot of things that are, are good and are healthy, but you also... Now that I reflect on what I was seeing, I was ill-equipped to see it at the time, but mm. there are a lot of things where um, churches that could and should have really solid theology just sort of give way to the, um, I guess you'd call it the, the current trend, you know, the zeitgeist of things going on at the moment. Yes, yeah. Which, which leads me to this little zeitgeist here, New Apostolic Reformation. Are you familiar, Brian? I am. Yeah. Are not, you familiar? Not, a, not an expert and I've never no, no, no. actually I've never actually met a person who I would say, "You know what? You are involved in the New Apostolic Reformation and you don't know it." So, I've I'm from the outside looking in, the the objective yes. observer, uh, not having that kind of a, you know, um, a, an experience or a history coming out of that type sure. of an environment, but uh, but it's very it's it's huge, it's dangerous, it's everywhere. Um, I've, I've, you know, I've kind of rubbed the edges of it. Um, I know yes. a school in this, in this, in the valley in which I live, that's been influenced. It's a, it's a private Christian school, and um, they've been influenced by it. Uh, okay. But it's, it's very dangerous, very dangerous. And who are some of the NAR folks that are most prominent that you've reviewed? Like, what do you know about them and, and their approach? Yeah, probably the you know the person that comes to mind right off the bat, and I just did a video on him was uh, Bill Johnson of Bethel Church. Um, yeah, and you know what, I I'm not sure that he doesn't actually believe what he's what he's preaching and saying. Now, mm. the the things that he the things that he purports in terms of miracles and um, healings and things like that, uh, I, I don't see how he could you know really believe that that's all happening because well you you were probably familiar yeah. with the, the 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 small child that died and they were trying to bring back yes. the life and it didn't happen um yes. but but you know he's he's a revivalist from the get-go and he sees this this movement as the you know kind of the, the harbinger of this worldwide revival that's going mm -hmm. to be taking place um lou engel is another guy that i've taken a yes. look at a couple times um, Chuck Pierce, I, I know of him and have been thinking about doing mm -hmm. a video on him. So various various leaders in that movement. Um, you know, the guy down the street from you, you know, Brian Houston. Um, they're they're all they're all just 
part of this huge movement that, that if, you, if you told them you're part of the NRA, NAR, they would say, what are you talking about? Because you know, it really isn't a, 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 an organized... Um, no, it's not. Yeah, it's, it's very loosely put together and cobbled here and there, and, but it's, you know, they've all got the same, the same emphasis of... Yes. Um, you know, it's a the, theological the, emphasis. Yes, yes, yes. It's all it theological. It all, and it's all error. It's all error. It is. There's so much there. The, the trick of that, and I think, folks, if you're listening, one of the things we're, we're not saying is that everything about those churches uh, is, you know, like not Christian or, or wrong. There's, you know, for deception to work, it has to look like a duck, but just not quite be a duck. Mm-hmm. Um, some of these, though, don't even look like a duck to be a duck. Uh, you know, there's, there's some, some rank things. But when I guess you can get NAR uh, low calorie. And right through to NAR full cream or you know double yes. double thick cream, uh, which is where I'd put Bill Johnson, uh, yeah. with and and people that even spin further off than him. If you call Kat Kerr and people like that, you know, yes. uh, it's it's such a web uh, of of disharmonious ideas. I'm surprised it hangs together, but it hangs together on a lack of internal critique and an over acceptance of a form of anything spiritual with the name Jesus is good. Yeah, yeah. Without any discernment at all. Yeah. It just seems to be a laissez-faire, we'll take on anything. And the more dramatic you can be, the, the, the closer to God you must be. Sure. Because he must be some kind of, um, God must be some kind of drama queen in their mind who's just waiting to do special things on a Sunday morning. Yeah. What, do, what do you see as the, um, the I, I guess, the actual dangers or the actual threats or, or, or risks of of that type of Bill Johnson, et cetera, type of work to to the church and to Christianity. Yeah, it's it's always <clears throat> going after the um, the experiential. You know, it's like I I, th- I look at I look at the people that that fill the seats of a place mm-hmm. like Bethel Church, and I I can't help but think of the. The, the Israelites waiting for Moses to come down the mountain and they okay. go, hey we don't we don't know what happened to this guy you know uh, That's Aaron right. Aaron make us a make you us a it. calf you know we're used to we're used to idols we came out of Egypt we want one too you know <laughs> so he throws in some gold you know and out comes this calf right oh, no, and so I they know. we we are so uh, inclined to want to, to to want to be able to not live by faith, but live by sight. And yes. we're not called to do that. We're called to live by faith. And that's the, that's the major problem I see in the signs and wonders movement, is people are so lusting after the liver shiver, as uh, Rod Rosenblatt, who's with the White Horse Inn, uh, we can talk about them in a second if you liver want. Liver shiver, that's um, great. But, but they, they're after that ex- experience. They want to feel God. They want to yeah. know that they know that they know, and they've got to see it rather than trust the promises yeah. that are in Scripture. Yeah, because if you go from one glittery little trinket to the next, you'll never be satisfied, you'll never be settled. I mean, I understand when people are in need and, say, spiritually hungry, but they're so badly taught, um, their hermeneutic is bad, so folks, hermeneutic just the, a, a correct, a healthy way to read and interpret scripture yeah. um, is that, you know, if you start looking for yourself in every chapter and verse rather than rather than looking for Christ, uh, you're in for a lot of frustration. Ali and I were um, a part of uh, a vineyard church for about 10 years oh. in, in Penrith. Now, it's like vineyard, I call it low calorie vineyard compared to what you would have in, you know, California where it all kicked off but this is in in western sydney um but still a a lot of work on spiritual experientialism Hmm. and and you know we thought that was a a a great thing we were hungry for things to happen we were a young couple um we then at the same time uh got into word of faith and you know these guys weren't into word of faith but we were and i've said Hmm. it a few times before you know like ken copeland is flying around in my jet and ken i want my money back but i know (laughs) i'm not going to get it right um it's not going to happen. Uh, I was an idiot. You know, a fool and his money are easily parted. Yes, but by the yes. grace of God, we're able... It, and it takes a while. Some of that scaffolding that someone put in the chats, you know, the narcissist of the whole thing, people seeing themselves everywhere, and you build this scaffolding based on someone else's 
um, really well thought out bad teaching, as in you can eisegete the text, you can proof text, and someone like me who wasn't trained can hear someone go, Scripture A, Scripture B, Scripture C, Scripture C equals you get more money. And I just went, yeah, that, that makes sense. That's yeah. in the Bible and it's all tied together. How logical is that? Yeah. So it easily, easily led astray from someone yeah. who was thinking and trying to think, but not thinking clearly and not trained how to think biblically. I didn't know the truth enough apart from the gospel was this simple little yeah. three-step three step dance. Yeah. And so folks like, you know, Bill Johnson, who was, you know, removed from Assemblies of God in the 1970s, if folks remember, um, has yeah. is, is now been really happily, healthily welcomed back in as the long lost superstar son. Mm. It's a really wow. interesting flip on what has happened with um, Pentecostal theology to allow those sorts of things in. Yeah. Um, how do you, Brian, here's, here's just another question, just to follow along with that. And it doesn't have to be about New Apostolic Reformation. Come on, click little thing. Mm. My buttons don't seem to be working very well down here on the drive shaft. So I'll just tell you, um, what about people that you you know that are involved? This is like a personal one. Let's just say there are family, close friends or nearby relationships. When this stops being YouTube mm-hmm. and it stops being theoretical and third person, yeah. what about when it's one-on-one, when it's personal or, or close? How do you navigate those relationships and the need or the want to be a bit more outspoken or clear about biblical truth when people bring up those sort of, you know, NAR, yeah. word of faith things. What do, you, what do you do? Where do you go with that? You know, Phil, I, I don't have that kind of experience because I don't run in those circles. What, sure. I, can't, what I can kind of correlate that with <clears throat> is where I grew up. Um, I grew up in the, in the PC USA. Uh, yeah, what's that? What's yeah? That's the Presby- Presbyterian Church, United States of America. That is the that's the liberal uh, flavor of uh, the Presbyterian Church uh, worldwide. Okay, it's, it's the most liberal. They they started going off the rails, you know, back in I want to say, well, probably back in the '70s when they started embracing women um, because of the equality mm-hmm. issues and so forth, and started allowing, <clears throat> excuse me, um, women to be elders and deacons, and pastors. Yeah. Um, and, and I grew up in a church that was probably one of the most loving churches that you could ever imagine. But, but as I grew up in that church, what I learned about was stories. I learned about Bible stories. I, I remember the, the flannel graph um, stories of Jesus and of the Old Testament. Uh, we even had something called the Crosley Room, where we had little dolls, and they'd do complete scenes, and it was on a 360-degree rotating uh, stage. They did a marvelous job, you know, and so I knew a lot of Bible stories. I Mm -hmm. just didn't know much about what the Bible was all about. And so as I grew up, um, I thought that was normal. And then one day I I was laying on my bed with my head on the pillow listening to a radio program called The White Horse Inn, and one Uh, of those guys were talking about justification by grace alone through faith alone. And I really had never, it either didn't listen when it was talked about at that church or actually never heard it. I'm, I'm not sure which one it, it is um, or which one it was. But as I, as I started embracing the doctrines of grace uh, while I was still at that church, I started realizing uh, what, what was missing. And it's odd. It's it's odd about the the PCUSA is they have a book of confessions that are that's about that thick. What they kept doing is just adding more and more confessions. Uh, you know, just well, we'll just add another one that gets a little. You know, it just kind of widens the umbrella a little bit. Wide, you know, a little bit bigger. So you can uh, change everything. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Hey. So I came to a point where I I could no longer, in good conscience, be part of that denomination, even though the church. Yeah. I, I grew up there and I loved people there. All that to say, I still meet with guys that are members of that church, and we've had lots of discussions, and it's all in good, good it's good-natured uh, discussions. But you know, trying to trying to tell them that they're they're with the denomination that that is going that that's already left the station in, in terms of yeah, its uh, diligent, you know, faithfulness to God's word, and yeah, um, and yeah. even though they might be a more faithful church within that denomination, it's kind of guilt by association, and yes. we must we must you know fear God, we must love God first, not not yeah. man, 
and be willing yes. to walk away if, if need be. So I, I had to do that. It was probably one of the hardest things I ever did in my life was walk away from the church of my youth. But yeah. I, I had to do it. But to answer your question, um, you do it with you do it with grace and you do it as, yeah. as patiently as you can, but you point out the areas that um, that may be blind spots for people, and um, and then hopefully you know you'll get people coming to you and saying, hey, <clears throat> you have a blind spot here. I'd like to point out, and then we can have a discussion and marshal the texts yeah. and and uh, the passages that are relevant, and and we we want to be you know uh, in obedience to God's word. That's that's what yeah. Christians want to. I, I think every Christian. Well, yes, I want to do God's will. I want to be obedient to His words. Uh, so that's that's what we need to be about. Yeah, no, that that that's um, actually really helpful. I think one of the things we've noticed, um, and it, sometimes it comes down to the structure of the church as well as to how easily they are influenced to move or do different things. But often, my wife refers to many many modern Western churches as the machine. Mm-hmm. So because they're run like a, a business machine, yeah. you have the pastor, just replace pastor with CEO. Correct. And then you've got the board that come under the pastor. Even They may be a business board, which means they sit to the side, but they're not influencing, in a lot of cases, the health and life of the church. And I've known people who struggle with the move of theology or the move of emphasis or the change of direction mm-hmm. or the new vision for the year or, or whatever non-necessary things are put there and they struggle by trying to stay in the denomination saying i'm going to hang out here maybe i can do some good yeah. and i go eventually i've learned to say it's probably not going to be a healthy thing for you yeah. you know the, the machine is moving on if it's going to move you, you're going to be dragged along with it or the yeah. other yeah. hey there was um one interesting question that's come up there's been a lot of great comments by the way folks there's just one that was actually a question and there's a lot going on I have a very simple man mind so I can't sort of read and talk and do these things very well at the same time although my wife and daughter did catch me multitasking this morning but you never heard that <laughs> um, but considering um, you know this question here could you talk about the future of biblical Christian content on YouTube given the current trend I think that's a, a good question to talk about where things may go because it talks about the you know one of the vehicles for our work and given given that youtube ceo um, was just awarded a free speech award by the youtube free speech awards hello (laughs) it's a bit (laughs) stalin-esque where do you think things are heading mate you know it's hard to say um i've I've often thought about that is when when is the day going to come where um the types of uh, subjects that we talk about, you know, biblical Christianity, is no longer going to be acceptable conversation on uh, on you know platforms such as YouTube and Twitter. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's already happening with uh, with political you know points oh, of yes. view, and so I, I see that you know we're not immune here in um, in America no. or or in Australia from from Christian persecution, and I think that. Um, it's just a matter of time. You know, this COVID, uh, this whole COVID shutdown and, and worldwide mm-hmm. pandemic as a result of this virus, um, I think has ushered in the, the antecedents of what could be uh, Christian persecution within the next decade. Uh, because the, the clamps are now starting yes. to tighten uh, government. You know, I, I think, and, and one of my, uh, the pastors of, my, of the church I attend is very, very helpful here. Um, the biggest threat to the church is always the same. It's been the same since the first century. And it is, he calls it the five enemies of the church. And that is Christian persecution. You've got um, the, the um, Christian deception, you know, biblical mm-hmm. error. You've got non-Christians, uh, unbelievers, and you've got... Um, the, the, just the world, you know, the, the world's yes. way yes. of thinking. Yes. And, and of course, be, be below all of that, uh, the, the soft white underbelly of that is the, 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 the red dragon, you know, Satan yeah. himself. And, yeah. and Revelation is the perfect book to uh, help us understand what the church is up against. And it's kind of like a sine wave. You know, there are times of, sure. of peace with, you know, certain, certain people, although there's always persecution going on somewhere in the world against Christianity. But the, the, the threat is always there, and we need to be on guard and prepared 
to to suffer to actually suffer for for Christ and His Church. It's um, yeah. it's just whether or not it's going to come in our lifetime, where our locality is. Uh, yeah. But but it could happen at any time. Well, suffering is one of those things that is should be implicit with Christianity. Um, it it it's not one of the things that people in the West have necessarily taken on automatically, like you might uh, if I give an example of. Um, a Christian in Indonesia, as an example, which is a mm-hmm. predominantly Muslim country, 180 yeah. million people just on our doorstep. Yeah. And, um, you know, Christians there, it's not uncommon for the churches to be burnt down. It's not uncommon for people to lose their jobs. These are just straightforward things that are happening to people. So when, uh, you, if, we, if we think about um, Wormbrand and the, the stories of persecution mm-hmm. in, you know, communist Romania, um, all, all of these things are modern history. Then all of these things are current and contemporary with what we're going through in the West. It's just happening to us in a different way. And because we've we've had countries, I would think, unhelpfully described as being Christian countries. Um, Christianity is not meant to be a kingdom of this world. I think that's a that's a, that's a that's an opposing dichotomy in that way. Um, yeah. And it allows us to fall into a false sense of security. We look for power on this earth. We become politically active. Now, I don't think in a democracy there's anything wrong if someone says, this is a democracy, what's your point of view? Giving your point of view and giving it accurately and giving it biblically. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. But when that water changes and you then have a dictatorship, which you've seen happen in, in many countries going from one form of government to another, yeah. um, then you know, where do you stand? Do you complain about your lack of freedom? Or do you start really remembering to embrace the call of sacrifice that Christ has put as, like, really it's the, one of the hallmarks of of Christianity is taking licks for Jesus, not because we're jerks, but because we're Christians. Yeah. You know, and I, I I see that as something um, online, going back to that question again, the censorship stuff is is very strong. Uh, there's lots of reasons to to say um, there's lots of reasons to say a biblical truth, and there's lots of reasons someone else has to say um, that that's just what would you call it these days? Hate speech. Yeah. So when truth becomes hate speech, and I think the truth of God has always been hate speech to people in the world. Sure, sure. It's um, you know? well, the you know, the um, the whole idea of being accountable to a creator to to the unregenerate person is yeah. absolute um, you know garbage in their ears. They don't want to hear it. They want to suppress that truth. Yeah. And yeah. that's Romans you know, one. Yeah, that's exactly right. And so yeah. there's there's always going to be that tension uh, between those whom God has called to be His own. And then yeah. once once we are his own, now he calls us to be witnesses to the truth, you know, to yeah. to be That's to be point. the people that testify uh, to the truth of the gospel. Yeah. And yeah. you know, the Lord's going to call who's who whom he's going to call to salvation. Our job is to witness yes. to the truth and and let the Spirit do His work. So. Yeah. You know that that's Absolutely. where we're at, and and so as long as in God's providence, because you know He not only creates all things, He absolutely sustains all things and guides all things, and so the fact that you and I are talking, you know, um, thousands of miles away from each I other, know. seventeen hours apart, you know, it's you're you're living in another day than I am, you know. That's I'm tomorrow, crazy. everyone. I am <laughs> you're in You're the tomorrow. future. I'm the future. The future to infinity and beyond. (laughs) Oh, I am Mrs. Nesbitt. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, the fact that we can do this, the fact that uh, Uh, YouTube has been made, uh, you know, the the technology that allowed this to be done is incredible. And so the gospel is going out. This is why, you know, I've done a lot of eschatology videos. um, And this is this is this is a good example of Satan being bound and us being Mm. I'm going to make people mad right now. But you go ahead us and being in, in the millennium right now, symbolically, that thousand-year period where Satan is bound, because right now, between you and I, we're talking about the truth of God's word, the truth of his gospel, and Satan can't do anything about it. He cannot deceive Australia, and he cannot deceive the United States as we talk about the gospel. Satan's very powerful. He can still do a lot of damage. 
but he is bound in terms of the gospel going out and God gathering up his sheep, his elect, that uh, finally will enter into, you know, escape Babylon that oh, we're yeah. living in right now and enter in to the new Jerusalem. Ultimately. And how grateful do you become for your salvation when you read through Scripture and you stop thinking about yourself and you start thinking about the grace of God and mm-hmm. going, yes, God, <laughs> thank you that you have chosen and called and elected me. That, that's beyond. It's not some wisdom of me to hear a good message and do some decision making on my part it's the the grace of god and i every time i stop and reflect on that mm. the gratefulness just overwhelms me Absolutely. and it probably doesn't overwhelm me enough but it, it still um, fills me with with joy and mm. you start to understand when um in the psalms it says you know restore to me the joy of my salvation you know i'd read that before and go yep that sounds great but i'm i didn't actually hear what i was reading and then when I actually read and understood what I was reading, and you look back through John 3 and, you know, Nicodemus is going, hey, how do you get saved, Jesus? And Jesus says, the wind blows, man. The wind yeah. blows where it wants to blow. That's right. And I'm thinking for the first 20 years reading that, what the heck is Jesus saying? What? I know he's saying something because he's the son of God. I'm just not getting it. Yeah. And then you finally get it and you go, it's the will of God. It's the power of God. It's the grace of God. It's the sovereignty of God. It's the choice of God. And yeah. like you said, Satan cannot stop that. Yeah, it's great yeah. to be on this side. Oh, no, it. it is so humbling because we, you know, we know ourselves. We know, you know, when we when we get get alone in the room, uh, we we look at ourselves in the mirror. We know who we are. We know what we're about. And how, oh yeah, how 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 bereft we are of any kind of favor from the God who created us. And yet he chose yeah. to be gracious to sinners. He, yeah. he, he justifies nothing. He justifies not people that try hard. He justifies the wicked. And that's, yes. you, you know, that's you and me. That, and by, yeah, by God's grace, we are in the kingdom. We didn't, we didn't go out and find a way to get born again. God regenerated no, our hearts right. by his grace, monergistically single work and we are recipients of his goodness that's we are. that's the bottom line and then i think that to me spins back into why like the work that we do in no apologies and you know your work as well it's it it emanates from the gratefulness of that freedom hmm. to say folks let me may i is it is is there in any way i can share the word of god with you or show the way that someone's not sharing the word of God with you in the light of God's word to let some of those scales fall from your eyes because you will be so relieved. You will be so relieved when you, you know, some of it may be great deception, some of it may be slight deception, but if you feel like in some way you're gonna be working for your salvation uh, or working to get closer to God or continually frustrated because you can't push in and lean yeah. in and stay in there enough and pray all through the night, um, you know, to make God happy. I'm like, no, no. <laughs> Jesus said, come to me if you are weary. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. And I never Amen. understood that until I understood the gospel better. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So, Brian, you, where to yeah. for you? From, yeah, mate, go ahead. No, I was going to ask no, where no, to. Please, go ahead. <clears throat> I was going to say, where to for you from here, my friend? You've got things on the boil coming up. We've just got a couple of minutes left. I usually try and keep the um, chats to an hour, just respect people's time. Absolutely. But where, where to for Bezel T3 from here? You know, I just keep doing what I do. And um, as long as people keep tuning in and, and watching my videos, I'm just going to continue to um, to share the gospel in any way that I can. And the right. way that I found that's effective is to use bad examples and, <laughs> and critique them and give good examples of how to interpret scripture with scripture. It's yes. not hard. It's not rocket science. You know, it's it's a story. Yeah. It's a, it's a story of God's redemption throughout you know uh, human history. And yes. human history is going to come to a close one day. Uh, yep. We're yep. we're we're hitting that that terminal marker. I think you know it could be in our lifetime, maybe not. But um, things are happening rapidly, and it's time to. Uh, each and every day get more serious about who we are as God's people and be more and more willing 
to do the simple stuff. You know, share share the gospel when it's when it's appropriate. When you've got somebody that's willing to listen. Yes, and, that's and right. Pray to to pray that God would bring about true revival. You know, not that we would be yes. world changers and take over the seven mountains. You know, of of uh, education <laughs> and business and you know media and all those things, but that we would. <clears throat> By simple means, you know, where God has placed us, be his yeah. instruments of his grace and allow the Spirit to do his work. Amen. And can I just say, I've never come across a conversation or an interview with such perfect timing. We are down to the second, and I want to thank you for that. That has to have a lot to do with your, your precision in aircraft maintenance where you have checklists <laughs> to guide your life that's right uh, that's right I doing the it. cross check yep every it time. always is there <laughs> look it's good hey folks i just want to say a big thanks for everyone who's joined us um morning breakfast time here in uh you know this this part of the world australia new zealand um, indonesia southeast asia uh moving around to of course the states where it's still yesterday when you catch up it's going to be like it is today only <laughs> different um, thank you so much for joining us. If you wouldn't mind, um, it always helps if you like the videos, subscribe, leave comments, share them with your friends if there are people you think these might be helpful to. We are just blessed and delighted that you're here. Yeah. Um, if you've got ideas or comments, uh, leave them for the No Apologies lads, myself, who is uh, Phil Chambers, Steve Fork and Harvey Ward, Craig Lloydell, or indeed Brian, the bezel man, but for now, we'll sign off and say thanks so much, and we'll catch you around the traps some other time. Thanks Sayonara, for having baby. me, Phil. Thank you. My pleasure, Brian. Thanks so much.